What if you could actually forgive the person who hurt you? I mean the one who really, really hurt you. They took something that was yours. They caused you unspeakable pain. They betrayed you. What if there was a way for you to completely and totally forgive them once and for all? This wouldn't be just a superficial forgiveness, but a deep, relationship-transforming, life-altering kind of forgiveness. Do you believe that's possible? Wouldn't you want to learn more about that kind of life? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Today, today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and we are in week four of our message series, Teach Us to Pray. If you're unfamiliar with Lent, it's the 40 days before Easter that the church sets aside to prepare our hearts to really be ready to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. And so typically people participate in Lent by either giving something up to remind them of the sacrifice of Christ or by picking up something new to remind them of the new life that he brings to us. This year during Lent, we are uh, just kind of slowing down and walking our way through the Lord's Prayer as a reminder that this is not just something Jesus told us to do, but it's really a prayer that as we pray has the potential to change our lives. So it comes from Luke chapter 11. We'll be in Luke 11 verse 4 this morning if you have a Bible with you. And in Luke 11, the the context where Jesus teaches the disciples this prayer is they've been walking with him for a while. They've been watching as he regularly goes off by himself to pray. They've witnessed before he performs miracles. He pauses to pray and they've recognized that Jesus' prayer life is directly connected to the the peace and the power that he experiences in his life. And they want to live like he lives. And so they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And then he gives them this very simple prayer here in Luke chapter 11. It's something we pray together every Sunday morning. And it, it really is not just a religious ritual, but it's a framework that describes what life in the kingdom that Jesus comes to establish is really like. So this morning we're going to spend some time exploring what does it look like for us to ask God to forgive us and for us to forgive others. In Luke chapter 11, verse 4, when Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray, he's telling us that each time we need to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. Now, culturally, forgiveness is something that uh, we all understand. You don't have to be a Christian to have ideas about forgiveness. You uh, understand because in every relationship, there's the opportunity to be hurt or to hurt someone else, that forgiveness is part of normal and healthy relationships. Now, that, that cultural understanding of forgiveness is good to a point, but this morning it's going to be challenging for us because what we're trying to do is not just say, Lord, teach us to forgive as our culture forgives, but we're trying to understand what it means for us to receive God's forgiveness and then to extend the exact forgiveness God gives to us to other people. And so if if we're going to uh, differentiate between those two, between cultural forgiveness and scriptural forgiveness, we first have to understand the the things that our culture teaches us about forgiveness. And if you want to know what our culture says or kind of what the common themes are in uh, certain relational or emotional uh, kind of arenas, then one of the the best people you can look to is obviously Dr. Phil, right? So (laughs) Dr. Phil teaches us about forgiveness, and he says forgiveness is a choice you make to release yourself from anger, hatred, and resentment. Now, you've heard sentiments like this from him or others. Uh, You've probably heard sentiments like that in church even, that you you forgive for your own sake, that when you forgive, you're setting yourself free, that you forgive. And and so in this cultural understanding of forgiveness, it's very much about forgiveness being a gift that you give to yourself. Right? This is about you setting yourself free. It's about you moving on from your past. It's about you moving away from people who bring you harm. And while there is some help in that, it's only a very shallow experience of forgiveness because it's very inward focused and it really winds up being very self-centered, which is not at all the way that God forgives us. 
You see, we all know that we are going to have to experience forgiveness in life. We know in our relationships with each other that at times we're going to be the one um, doing the wrong thing, and other times we're going to be on the receiving end of the wrong thing. And so we know we need to give and receive forgiveness. My hope for you this morning is that you will lay aside some of these uh, cultural presuppositions about forgiveness that you've come in with, and we will instead let the Scriptures teach us about the way God forgives us and how that then transforms the way we forgive each other. So Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. Now this is a two-part prayer, and the first part is for us to consider each day our need for God's forgiveness. And so when we begin to explore that, we have to understand, well, exactly how does God forgive us? And the scriptures are abundantly clear to us from Genesis to Revelation. Again and again and again, the scriptures are telling the stories of God's love, of his forgiveness being extended to his people over and over and over again. And one of the the first things we have to understand about God's forgiveness is that he does not take it lightly. God is not a doting grandparent who just looks at us like his grandchildren and is like, oh, that's okay, don't worry about it. Right? Now, now, you've experienced this, either, either you're the parent of a, a child and you watch the way your parents treat them, or some of you, uh, you're, your grandparents here this morning and you're guilty of this. I, I know you are because almost every loving grandparent is. I, Angie and I have three kids. I grew up with three brothers and sisters. There were four people, four kids in our house, and my dad was, um, he was a great dad, Uh, but he wasn't going to mess around with anything, right? There were rules and there were consequences. And if you messed up, you were, you know, so uh, there were, there were a lot of like Chris, go get the paddle moments for me growing up, uh, which then transitioned into Chris, go to your room. Chris, give me your car keys. There were a whole lot of these, my name followed by a consequence moments. So we, Angie and I have kids. And we go and we visit my dad and his wife, and suddenly this strict disciplinarian, Mr. Rules and Authority, uh, has lost his mind, right? And it's just like, I see my kids doing things, and I'm like, Dad, seriously? You spanked me for that so many times. And you, like, not only are you not, like, I'm walk, you know, I've been out and I walk back in, they're just losing their mind, and it's 7.30 in the morning, and they've got Dr. Pepper in both hands and cinnamon rolls on the table, and just, like, the crazy eyes. I'm like, Dad, what is going, he's like, it's fine, don't worry about it. It's just like, this is such, it's not even double, it's like a quadruple standard or something. This is, this is completely wrong. Like, not only would you never let me do that, but you're encouraging my kids to do it. And the things you thought were so terrible in me, you find so adorable in them. And it's this terrible standard of like, oh, don't worry about it. They're fine. Now, sometimes I think we think of God's forgiveness that way. That he's just so big and so magnanimous and so full of love, like a, a grandpa for his grandkids, a grandma for her granddaughters, that, that we think God just kind of looks at us and is like, oh, yeah, I mean, you probably shouldn't, but that's fine. Don't worry about it. But that's not what the scriptures teach us. This morning, at the end of our service, we're going to take time to receive communion together. And when we receive communion, what we're being reminded of is God's forgiveness does not ignore our sin, but it confronts it head on. He comes and bears with the full force of his power and glory the weight of our sin, and he crushes it on our behalf, and then he extends that forgiveness to us. So when we are praying, God, forgive us of our sins, We're not praying, God, just kind of overlook my goof-ups and mistakes. But what we're praying is, God, come work in the deepest parts of my heart, in the most deformed parts of my personality, and transform me by your power and grace into your likeness. Forgive us our sins is not just a simple little prayer, but Jesus tells us to pray it so that we will consider the depth of, of God's love, compassion, and action in the world on our behalf. Now, the scriptures go on to teach us various things about the way that God forgives us. One of the most important things that we need to understand is that God forgives us freely. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's no way we will ever deserve it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's making this point to us that God's offer of forgiveness precedes our sin. 
Now, we, you know that. If you've grown up in church, you've heard that before. That's not a new idea. That's not a new phrase. But what I want you to do is stop for just a moment and think about how that applies to your life. It means there is no sin. There is no shame. There's no thing that you've done. There's no person that you've wronged that can run deeper than God's ability to forgive you. Before you sinned, before you thought of repenting, before you felt bad about it, before you experienced any guilt or shame related to it, God has chosen in Christ to extend forgiveness to you. So this transforms the way we walk through seasons of guilt and shame and discomfort over the choices that we've made. It means that we can never out the grace of God. That he's chosen to extend forgiveness to us before we have ever even thought of turning our face towards him. So God's forgiveness is a gift that he gives to us freely, and he gives it to us for our sake, not for his. Not only is it free, but God's forgiveness is complete. Right? There are times in life where we are tempted to extend conditional forgiveness. I'll forgive you as long as you promise. I'll forgive you if you never. This is not the forgiveness that God offers to us. The forgiveness he extends is one that completely separates the stain of sin from the sinner. Throughout the scriptures, we are told again and again and again. In Micah chapter 7, God says, I will cast your sins into the depths of the sea. In Isaiah 43, he says, I'm the one who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. In Jeremiah 31, he says, I will forgive your wickedness and remember your sins no more. And in Psalm 103, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. These passages are there to to teach us, and there are so many others like them in the scriptures that teach us this idea that God doesn't just forgive us, but he completely erases the stain of that sin from our life. Right? This is not God saying you get to move from the bad line to the good line, but I always remember you used to be in the bad line. That's probably where you really belong. But instead, it's God saying, I willfully choose to never again remember your sins or hold them against you. When Jesus tells us, pray every day, God, forgive us our sins. We come not just groveling, saying, God, if you could possibly just one more time, maybe, please, just enough to get me into heaven. But it's supposed to remind us of the amazing grace of God that when we ask him to forgive us, not only does he give us that position in life, but he completely separates our sin from us. He no longer looks at us as repentant sinners, but he looks at us as those who have been completely remade in the image of his son. This is the complete and total nature of God's forgiveness. This is honestly completely beyond our ability to understand or to experience. But that is why it's so important for us to come back day after day after day and and pray, God, forgive me of my sins. Because it leads me deeper into this understanding of his grace is amazing. His grace is, there's there's nothing like it in the world. It's free, it's complete, and then the scriptures also teach us that when God forgives us that way, he does it for a purpose. And his purpose is to restore our identity as his sons and his daughters. If you were here a couple weeks ago when we began this series, we started by talking about what it means for God to be our father. We looked at Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son and the loving father, where a a son comes to his father and basically says, hey, I wish you were dead, give me your money, and I'm going to take off. And his dad does it. And the son goes out and he blows all the money and he wastes everything that his dad has given to him. And then he has this kind of rock bottom moment where he decides, you know, I'd be better off being a servant than out here starving to death. So he goes home intending to offer this long uh, apology to his father. And the, the, Jesus tells a story and he says, as the son is walking home, the father is at the house and he's watching out on the horizon. It says that when he sees his son in the distance, he runs towards him. He's filled with compassion for him, and he throws his arms around him, and he tells him, you are my son, you are dead, and you are alive. Come inside, we're throwing a party, we're inviting the family, we're inviting the neighbors. All of the shame, all of the, all of the, the negative things the son has done, all of that is being removed, and he's welcomed back into the family. And this is how God forgives us. 
He forgives us freely. He forgives us completely so that we will take our place and pick up our identity as his sons and his daughters. In his grace, he moves towards us and accomplishes for us what we could never do on our own. Forgiveness is his gift alone to give to us. And he does it freely and he does it extravagantly. And when we begin to understand that, it transforms our hearts. See, I believe it's, it's important for us to pray this prayer of repentance on a daily basis. Not because we're insecure in our salvation. Right? I, I mean, I remember those nights as a, especially a middle school, high school student. Like Every night before I would go to bed, before, the last thing I would do before I would close my eyes is pray, God, please forgive me for whatever sins I committed today. I usually, I mean, I usually had one or two in mind, um, but I also knew there were probably another 10 or 12 that I was overlooking at that particular moment. And I, uh, I just had this insecurity and fear in my heart that if, I don't, if that's not the last word that I say, then I might die tonight and go to hell. And that would kind of suck. So, just God forgive me, just in case. Now, that is not what Jesus wants us to experience, right? It is not this fear-based relationship. And there were nights that, like, I would, I would say that prayer, and then I would, you know, that night where you don't fall asleep too well, and your mind goes in a, a hundred different directions, and so 15 minutes later, I'm praying again, God, please forgive me for all the things I thought in the last 15 minutes. Just make sure I have my spot. Like, this is not what Jesus is teaching us. What he's teaching us is, look, pray for repentance, ask for forgiveness regularly, Not because you're trying to earn this, not because you're trying to grab onto it, but because it's an opportunity for your heart again to consider the amazing grace of God that's been extended to you. And as you consider his amazing grace, you will begin to understand that it runs deeper than your sin and your shame. And not only does he forgive you from the things you've done, but he sets you free to not have to live that way again in the future. This is such a a powerful thing, and it's it's why we need to have regular prayers of confession and repentance to the Lord. Now, we all know all of that if you've been around church any amount of time. Even if you haven't, you have this idea that God forgives people. It's kind of his, his thing. But Jesus tells us it's not enough just to pray forgive us our sins, but we're also asking that God will help us forgive others when they sin against us. And Jesus knew that we were not living in a utopian society where everything was just wonderful and everyone got along all the time. He knew that we would be hurt by those in the world. He knew that there would be times we'd be hurt by our brothers and sisters in Christ, that our closest friends and family members would cause pain to us. And so in those moments, we would need to extend forgiveness to them. And there would be times that we are the cause of the pain and we need to receive forgiveness from them. And so when we think about what does it look like later in Ephesians 4, Paul tells us that we are to forgive each other just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Well, what then does that really look like for us to forgive each other? First of all, I think we have to understand that we're supposed to forgive each other freely. This is a gift that we give. Now, before we get down this road too far, I want to caution you. Don't let this morning uh, just kind of be a theoretical exercise in your mind. Don't walk away knowing something about forgiveness, but what I want you to do is is think about that person who has wronged you. Think about the one who has hurt you. Think about the one who has betrayed you. Think about the one who has said the most horrible things, who has done the most awful things, the one who has ruined your soul, who has wrecked your life, and consider that Christ's command to you is to forgive them as he has forgiven you. And what does that mean? It means in that relationship with that person, forgiveness is a gift you come to give them free of charge. That you're not doing this for yourself. You're not doing it to set yourself free. You're not doing it to make yourself feel better. You're not doing it so that you look like a better person. But you are coming to extend forgiveness because that's what God has done in you. And as you consider his amazing grace that's been sown into your heart, it will overflow into your other relationships. And so it it changes our forgiveness experience with each other because it's no longer, I'll forgive you when, but it's just, I'll forgive you. This is a gift that I come to bring to you, and you offer it whether they want to accept it or not. It's a completely free gift. A couple years ago, I read this book called um, Free of Charge, Giving and Forgiving in a Culture Stripped of Grace. 
And if, if you struggle to wrap your mind around the ideas of forgiveness and what that looks like and how it plays out, I would encourage you to, to buy a copy of that book and read through it. I read through it in a, a period of life where I was really struggling in a, in a specific relationship and trying to figure out. I had went through the, the patterns of cultural forgiveness. I had said that I forgive this person. I had told them that verbally, and yet I knew in my soul there was unresolved bitterness and anger and rage, and I didn't know how. And, and this book just kind of came to me during that season. And so I began to read it, and in it, the, the guy who writes it is a man named Miroslav Volf. Wolf is a professor at the Yale Divinity School, and so he has this incredible academic background. But even more importantly, as he writes about forgiveness, he shares of his personal story of growing up in the former Soviet Union. He was the son of uh, pastors who, who led this small church who were persecuted for their faith. He tells the story of his young brother who died tragically in an accident due to the, the negligence of one of his neighbors. And he talks about watching his mom work through this long process of forgiveness with the neighbor. And he tells a story of when he was uh, forced to join the army, as all the men in his country were, and they found out he was a Christian, and the stories of the interrogations and the persecution, the uncertainty that he faced, particularly at the hands of this one particular captain in the army. And as he begins to work both the scriptural and the theological understandings of forgiveness with his own story, he he started to use this phrase that has just stuck in my mind ever since. He talks about, you know, we have to forgive freely. And then he also spent a great deal of time talking about how we have to forgive completely. That the way God forgives us is he separates our sin from our identity. He no longer, it's not just that he no longer holds it against us, but it's that he chooses to no longer remember it at all. That it is totally and completely gone. And so in the book, Wolf begins to tell this story of, you know, this is my longing to experience forgiveness in this deep and meaningful way. And he longs for the day, he says, I I, I hope for the day that if I were ever to see my captain again, that I could look at him and no longer remember the wrongs that he had committed against me. Because the work of Christ's forgiveness had been grown so deeply in my heart and had overflowed so significantly into these relationships that everything was completely transformed by the forgiveness of God. It was so challenging to me, and he, I want to share just a little portion of that with you. That book, Wolf writes, Forgiveness hopes for a world perfect and indestructible world of love in which such such moments will be the pervasive reality. Forgiveness will then reach its own fulfillment. The forgivers and the forgiven will no longer need to remember the transgressions whose punishments forgiveness has foregone and whose guilt it has lifted. This is the, I mean, so consider that versus Dr. Phil. Right now, I'm sure Dr. Phil's a good guy, but he is so incredibly wrong and shallow in his understanding of forgiveness. This is forgiveness. That the day where it has worked its way to the point that the transgressions are forgotten, the guilt is removed, and it is all no more, and the relationship is totally restored, versus you should forgive so that you're not full of hate and bitterness. You should forgive as a gift to yourself. Wolf goes on and he he uses this phrase that has has really transformed my understanding of what it means to forgive again and again and again. He says that as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are called to forgive to the end of memory. And just consider that. Again, consider that in, in your relationships. Consider that with the person who has wronged you, who has hurt you. Does it even seem possible? So I, I read this book six, seven years ago, whatever it was, and, and this relationship I was trying to work through, I mean, I, I was so convicted, I, I wound up sending, sending this guy an email and just saying, hey, listen, I know I've probably told you a dozen times I forgive you, but God's been revealing to me that, that I, I haven't, actually. And so I, I want you to know I'm beginning this process in, in trying to reach this point, and, and I explain some of these thoughts I've just shared with you. And I got an email back from him that said, that's nice. I really don't think that's possible. He said, I, I know what I did, and I'm sorry, and I just, out this side of heaven, I don't think a day will come where you will no longer remember that. 
He said, I, I know a day won't come where I no longer remember that. And so it's, it's this tension we live in. This is what the scriptures tell us. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Forgive freely. Forgive completely. Forgive to the end of memory. And yet our reality says, you can't do that. The disciples faced a similar struggle at one point, and they come to Jesus and they ask him, how many times do we have to forgive someone when they sin against us? And Jesus tells him, you're to forgive them 70 times 7. Now, you math people already are like, okay, so that many times? No, that's not, it's not a math problem, right? This was not the disciples' ACT where Jesus is like, and now I have a, a grammar section for you. It's not that. But instead, he's pointing them toward this idea of you are to forgive again and again and again and again and again and again, and you can stop forgiving them when you no longer remember the wrong they committed. Forgive to the end of memory. But it is so hard for us to live that way. It is so hard for us to forgive that way. Because typically we're telling people, okay, well, well, I'll forgive you, but what we really mean is I've just decided not to hate you anymore. Right? I mean, that's what we mean. We don't mean I love you, welcome into the family, uh, come and share my things. We mean I've decided not to cuss in my head when I see you. Right? I mean, I know none of you would do that because you're very, very spiritual and mature, but that's what we mean. We don't mean freely. We don't mean completely. We mean conditionally. We mean, I'll forgive you as long as you never do that again to me. And we take this free gift of forgiveness, and and in that situation, we turn it into a threat. We turn it into, well, this one time, but never again. Right? Or on the other side, we say, well, I'll forgive you, but I will never forget what you did to me. I'll never forget about it. And in doing so, we're telling that person, "I'll, I'll forgive you, but it'll never be complete. You're always going to wear that scarlet letter. Every time I see you, I'm going to see that's the guy that I forgave for stealing money from me. That's the girl that I forgave for firing me from my job. That's the dad that I forgave for leaving my mom. That's the mom that I forgive for walking out on me. And we attach these identities to people. But Jesus is telling us every single day you are to pray, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who've sinned against us. And our longing is that we will forgive others to the same depth that God has forgiven us. But we know it's impossible. And so we come to this point, and I can only imagine what it's like for the disciples that day. I mean, Jesus is teaching them this prayer, and they're seeing the way that he lives. And there has to be, at least at times, an element of hopelessness for the disciples of, we will never be like him. We'll never be good enough. We'll never be strong enough. I mean, look at Jesus walks on the water. He feeds the 5,000. We're never going to be as good as him. Look at how kind, look at how forgiving he is. We can't do it. And you and I, if we rely on our own strength, we'll reach that same point of exasperation of it's enough, I can't do it. Back to the cultural forgiveness. And yet this morning, as we receive communion together, what we are being reminded of is that in all the ways we are inadequate, Christ is sufficient. That in every arena where we are unable, he is perfectly able. We remember that not only does his sacrifice forgive us of our sins, but he brings us into a new way of life where we can now live in his kingdom. We can be part of his world. And so as we consider it today, what that means for us is we must commit ourselves to the process of forgiveness. We cannot settle for well, at least I don't hate them anymore. We cannot settle for, I don't know that God can really completely forgive me and set me free from this thing. But instead, we give ourselves to the gospel every moment. We remember it, we consider it, and we allow God to work it deep into our hearts. And so, in just a moment, when you hold the bread and the cup in your hands, it's a reminder to you that what Jesus has called us to do, he has also provided a way for us to do. That his offer of forgiveness is made permanent and made powerful through his death and resurrection. 
and that our ability to forgive others does not reside in our own spiritual convictions or character, but it resides in the fact that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in us. And so every moment when I see the one who's wronged me, Every moment where a new hurt comes not only becomes an opportunity for me to extend forgiveness, but becomes another opportunity for me to experience God's grace myself. And so if you're here this morning wondering if he can forgive you, may the bread and the cup remind you that not only can he, but he's already provided for it. That his offer of forgiveness preceded your sin and runs deeper than your sin. And for those of us, for all of us, who still have those relationships where you think, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not quite there yet. That's okay. It's a sign that you need God's grace. Communion is a reminder that he has extended it to us. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray with you. The band's going to come and lead us in a song as the ushers pass those elements to us. God, we come to you today as people in need of your forgiveness. You see our sins and our failures. You see the ways that we have given in to selfishness and self-righteousness. Lord, you see those of us who are convinced you can never forgive us. And you see those of us who are convinced we don't need you to forgive us. Lord, I pray for each person this morning that your spirit would come and speak to us. Challenge us of our need for repentance. And remind us that you have provided the means by which we can receive forgiveness. We can be renewed. We can be restored. Lord, as you work that in our hearts, may it overflow into our relationships. In Jesus' name.
should have been lost forever Yeah, I should be in that fire But now there's fire inside of me Here I am, a dead man walking No grave's gonna hold God's people All the weight of all our evil Lifted away forever free and the cup this morning, it's a reminder to us that all we need, Christ has provided. So in every area that we need forgiveness, he extends it freely and completely. May the act of receiving this together this morning be symbolic of our surrender to his heart. As we turn our face towards him, we see him running towards us, extending this free and complete forgiveness, restoring our identity as his sons and his daughters. You take the bread with me. And the cup. After the first service this morning, I was talking with a couple guys afterwards. And we were having a conversation of, well, but how do you know? Like, we get that we're supposed to forgive people, but how do you know? Because sometimes people are just jerks. Sometimes people just do wrong things to you, and you, you don't necessarily feel like they've wronged you personally. They just, that's who they are. So how do, you, how do you know? When do you know that you need to extend forgiveness, and when is it just a relationship that you just kind of move on from and don't give any concern to? So as we had that conversation, the, the scripture that came to mind was Ephesians chapter 4, which you referenced earlier, where Paul tells us, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And so it's easy for us, I think, to hear messages like this and to immediately begin to excuse ourselves from participating in the forgiveness that we have received. To say, well, that's true, but you don't know my circumstances, you don't know what they've done to me. Before we finish this morning, I want to encourage you that if in your heart you think of that person and you feel bitterness, you feel rage, you feel anger, you feel the need to brawl or to slander. You feel malice, you feel anything but kindness and compassion. It's an opportunity where the Spirit is speaking to you that you need to forgive. And you need to forgive freely and you need to forgive completely. You need to forgive to the end of memory. Jesus tells us in another story, he says that unless you forgive your brother his sins, God will not forgive you of yours. This is not a conditional statement. It's not Jesus saying you have to do this to earn that. But instead, a, a better way to understand it is it's Jesus saying, look, that the proof that you've received God's forgiveness is that you're willing to share that forgiveness with others. And if you're unwilling to share it with others, it's a sign that perhaps you have not experienced it yourself. So this morning, as they lead us in a final song, I want to encourage you, if you, in the depths of your heart, acknowledge you need to receive God's forgiveness or you need to extend it to others, don't leave without making a movement in that direction this morning. Perhaps the person is here that you need to extend forgiveness to. Maybe it's as simple as walking back to the prayer room and saying, I need you guys to pray with me that I'll have the courage to do this. Jesus tells us to pray this prayer together. It's a way for us to hold one another accountable, to live in the new life that he's brought to us. 
his kingdom comes, his will is accomplished as we receive God's forgiveness and as we share it with our brothers and sisters. So if you'll stand with me this morning, I want to pray one final prayer for us. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what God is saying, what the Spirit is revealing in your heart and in your relationships. Lord, we come to you today in need of your forgiveness individually and desperate to experience it relationally. God, you see the parts of our hearts. You see the relationships, the friendships, the coworkers, the neighbors, where our lives are full of bitterness, anger, rage, slander, and malice. Where we have no kindness, we have no compassion, we want to offer no forgiveness. So Lord, this morning we lay down our self-righteousness and we lay down our excuses. And we ask that your grace would come and bring life to every part of our heart today. We release those sources of pain and anger. We release those who have wronged us and sinned against us. We release those who refuse to acknowledge the sins that they have committed against us. Lord, we ask that your spirit would work your grace deep in our hearts as we understand the free and complete, as we experience the free and complete nature of your forgiveness, the restoration of our identity as your sons and your daughters, may we be willing to share it with others. But I pray this morning that you would restore the relationship between fathers and sons. God, that you would, you would restore by your grace the relationships of mothers and daughters. Pray that you would turn the hearts of husbands towards their wives and wives towards their husbands. Pray that you would set us free from the burden and the shame of the wrongs that we have committed and those that have been committed against us. Lord, I pray for those who are here today that that the, the restoration of a relationship is no longer possible because of death or disinterest or some form of distance. Lord, I pray even now that they will still release that gift of forgiveness to the other and experience your grace working deep in their heart. God, take the brokenness of our lives and remake it into your image. Lord, may what you are working in us be worked through us. In Jesus' name. you need to receive that forgiveness, if you need to share that forgiveness with someone else, as we sing this final song, I can't encourage you strongly enough. Head out those back doors to your left. Let someone join with you in prayer, believing that his grace is sufficient, his grace will be extended to you, and his grace will be extended through you. The rest of us, let's sing this as a declaration of our faith of this is what God does in us.